Welcome again to this online service from St Mary Magdalene Liminster and a very particular welcome if you're joining us for the first time. Today we're celebrating the Ascension, the fact that after 40 days on earth following his resurrection, Jesus returned to his rightful home in heaven, having completed everything he needed to do on earth. He returned to his father's right side, to the seat of authority and power. And also he returned with his resurrection body, which you'll remember bore the marks of the nails. And so he took our humanity back with him into heaven, a sign, a pledge of what lies ahead for us. But that's not all. Having finished his work on earth, Jesus promised that when he went away, he would return again, but in the person of his Holy Spirit. And that's, of course, what we will remember next week at the Feast of Pentecost. But today, as we remember the Ascension, we begin our service with a verse from Psalm 47. God has gone up with a shout, the Lord with the sound of the trumpet. And we listen or we sing our first hymn, which captures something of the wonder and the joy of this day. Look ye saints, the sight is glorious. See the man of sorrows now. Jesus, our Lord and King, still bears the marks of the nails, and so let us remember before him with sorrow and with sadness those times over the last week when we have fallen short of what God wants, whether deliberately or carelessly. And so we pray, Lord Jesus, forgive us when we fail to love you as we should. Lord, have mercy. Lord Jesus, forgive us when we fail to care for others. Christ, have mercy. 
Lord Jesus, forgive us when we fail to live with faith, hope and joy. Lord, have mercy. St John wrote that if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just. He will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so we pray. Loving Lord Jesus Christ, we are conscious of the times when we have failed you over the last week. And we ask now, please, for your forgiveness and for your restoration. In Jesus' name, Amen. And the Collect for Ascension Day. Grant, we pray, Almighty God, that as we believe your only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, to have, sent, have ascended into the heavens, so may we, in heart and mind, thither ascend, and with him continually dwell, who is alive and reigns with you in the power of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and for ever. Amen. Our first reading this morning is read by Carol Hatton, and is taken from the letter of James. The reading this morning is from James chapter 3. Not many of you should become teachers, my fellow believers, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. We all stumble in many ways. Anyone who is never at fault in what they say is perfect, able to keep their whole body in check. When we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we can turn the whole animal. Or take ships as an example. Although they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are steered by a very small rudder wherever the pilot wants to go. Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. Consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. The tongue is also a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole body, sets the whole course of one's life on fire, and is itself set on fire by hell. All kinds of animals, birds, reptiles and sea creatures are being tamed and have been tamed by mankind. But no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil, full of deadly poison. With the tongue, we praise our Lord and Father, and with it we curse human beings who have been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this should not be. Can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? My brothers and sisters, can a fig tree bear olives, or a grapevine bear figs? Neither can a salt spring produce fresh water. This is the word of the Lord. Our second reading this morning replaces the Gospel, and it's the account of the Ascension given by Luke in Acts chapter 1. While staying with them, Jesus ordered them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait there for the promise of the Father. This, he said, is what you have heard from me. For John baptised with water, but you will be baptised with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, is this the time when you will restore the kingdom as well? And he replied, it is not for you to know the times or periods that the Father has set by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And when he had said this, as they were watching, he was lifted up and a cloud took him out of their sight. While he was going and they were gazing up towards heaven, suddenly two men in white robes stood by them. And they said, 
Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up towards heaven? This Jesus, who has been taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. This is the word of the Lord. Heavenly Father, we talk about our words, but we know that it is your word that can give us life. So would we now give our attention to your word and your spirit speaking through it into our hearts, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. James 3, 1 to 12, a great passage all about trying to control and understand our speech, our tongue as James calls it, all about how we uh, can use our words either for good and for building up and for glorifying God or for bad and destruction and even deadly poison, he says. But it starts with that opening verse, James 3, verse 1. And this is the second time that I've ever preached on this passage. The first time that I preached on this passage was I was at Bible college. And each week a different member who was at the college and training would preach at the weekly service. And I actually had a major service where other guests came in as well. So you sort of picture the scene of the, the chapel in the college, a sort of traditional Cambridge college. Uh, with, with me there, a very nervous me preaching, uh, all of the people in my year and the two years below me that were all training to be vicars or ministers of some form, and also all the academic staff, those who'd not only done that for many years, but had actually given their life to teaching people how to enter into ministry. It's literally me, nervous, preaching in front of my peers, which is hard enough, and the people that were teaching us about preaching, and I had to stand up and the very first verse of my reading says, brothers and sisters, not many of you should be teachers. I tell you now, I still get slightly nervous just thinking about it. But thankfully, God is good. And it's not down to me and my words, but his words speaking to us. And I pray that'll be the same for us. We may not all be teachers of God's word. In fact, actually, it says very few should because there is this extra accountability but all ministry is important. Every one of us counts to God. Each of us has given gifts to use in different situations, which are all part of his big picture, his family, the church. And so this bit, although it starts like that, moves on to how we as Christians should be speaking. So practical. Because God has given us speech. God is a God of word. If you read the Bible, it starts very much with the word of God, bringing creation to life. The word of God is the word, the scriptures, which are the basis and the foundation and the lifeblood of the Christian. And God himself is called the word when Jesus enters into the world, the God there, God speaking in person, the word. God is all about the words and he's given us words as well. He's given us language we can speak. But how are we going to use it? What do we use that God-given gift for? God has given us speech, you see, but it's very powerful. That's the first thing that James wants us to see. He uses some wonderful illustrations to show how just a very small thing like the tongue, our speech, can have such an impact on other things. He compares it to the, the bits that you put into a horse's mouth. I'm not going to pretend that I know anything about horse riding. I know some of you will do. But I do know that, that when James is referring to, there is a small thing that goes into the horse's mouth and with it, you can control and guide the whole of the horse. Or he says it's like a rudder on a boat, a huge boat capable of great journeys, but controlled by a relatively small part of it. And he says that this tongue, this speech that we're given by God is very powerful. Now, it's funny, actually, because often we think of it the other way around. We think that our tongue is sort of the, the end of the process, so that whatever is going on in our hearts and minds can come out in our speech. And of course that's true. Jesus himself says that it's in our heart that these things lie, and then we reveal it in the way that we speak. But James says it's also true the other way around, that actually your tongue is powerful, your speech is powerful. The way that you talk, the things that you talk about, the manner in which you speak will have an impact on the whole of the rest of your life. It's not a separate little thing. It's powerful and it's controlling. So we need to think about the way that we speak. How does the way that I speak influence the rest of my life? 
I'm trying to follow Jesus and trying to live a life that is living for him. And yet in my speech, in my talk, in the way that I communicate with my family and my friends, the way that I write emails or send messages, however it is, if that speech isn't trying to lead me down that path of glorifying God, then my rudder is bent out of shape. James says, God has given a speech, but it's powerful, so be careful. And the second thing he says is even more of a warning that God, yes, God has given a speech, but actually it can be dangerous. He compares it to a small fire that can burn down a whole forest. Our speech, if we're not careful, can do so much damage. Sometimes we forget that it can do damage to us. What do we say about ourselves? Do we remind ourselves and tell ourselves the good news of what we believe as Christians? Maybe you've never done that. Maybe you're not a Christian watching this. Well, the message of the gospel is that God loves you, that you're made in his image, and even though you've turned away and fallen into sin, God loved you enough to die for you. He says, I choose to die for you. I choose to give you life. And when you accept that, when you receive it, you are a precious child of God, forgiven, redeemed, restored, welcomed into the family, loved like Jesus himself by the Father. Do you tell yourself that? Or do you use your speech to put yourself down, to forget that you too are made in God's image, as we'll get on to in a moment? I just wanted to say that because I think that sometimes as Christians we feel that when we're trying to be humble we actually end up putting ourselves down and that's not what God wants us to do. That tongue, that speech can do a lot of damage to ourselves. But James also wants us to see how dangerous and how deadly our speech can be for other people. That unguarded word, that email which is quickly fired off and not thought through how it's going to impact on the person who reads it. The way that we use language, the kind of language that we use, the kind of words that we use to describe other people or situations that we're in. You can tell somebody who's been immersed in the Bible because when they speak and when they pray, those sort of words, those kinds of expressions come out in their speech. Are we aware that this speaking that God has given us is a dangerous thing? It doesn't mean it's a bad thing. It just means we need to be super careful with the way that we use it. God's given us speech, but it's powerful and it can be dangerous. The third thing that James reminds us of is a really positive one. That our speech has been given to us and is intended for praise. He does it by drawing a contrast. He says, you know, by the same tongue, the same mouth, the same speech, in one breath you praise God and then in another breath you curse somebody made in the image of God. Brothers and sisters, this should not be so. That tongue was given to you to praise God and to praise the things that he's made. And yet James can see that for some of these followers of Jesus, in one breath they're praising God, they're singing their hymns, they're they're saying all the right things and then yet in another breath the back is turned and they're speaking of people in a way that would make them ashamed if Jesus was there. Of course, he is there. And our tongue and our speech was given to us primarily to praise God. We find our greatest fulfillment, our greatest value and worth actually doing what we were made to do, and that is to know God and to love God and to praise God. That's why praise and worship is such a great thing to be able to do. One of the big losses that we're feeling at the moment, because actually that is a key part of who we are. It's not an optional extra In our services, the singing is not just the advert break between the core things that happen. It's all part of it. Being able to use our voice to praise God is what we were made for, and it's what we'll be doing in eternity. We know it's what we were made for because that is the picture that we have of this glory, that we'll be enjoying being able to praise God, like we do when we enjoy praising the things that mean the most to us. So James says, How can you be using your tongue, your speech in one hand to praise God and then in another, another breath, cursing those made in God's image? It's a wonderful practical part of the letter, isn't it? It's so relevant to every culture and every age. This never gets old. It's always a challenge. How do we use our speech for good instead of for bad? How do we build up instead of destroy? How do we praise God instead of cursing those things God has made? 
Well, the answer is to ask God, to invite him to be at work so that our speech is increasingly his speech, our words increasingly his words, and to remind ourselves of the gospel, that we all mess this up. We all make mistakes in what we say and what we don't say. But thankfully, God sent the Son to die for that in order that we might be transformed and renewed, forgiven and restored. Just think of Jesus. Think of the way he used his words. Which phrases come to mind? I'll tell you two that particularly come to mind for me. When he was beaten, hurt, accused of things he hadn't done, he just stayed silent. He knew that that was what he'd come to do. And then when they finally pinned him up on the cross to die for sins of others but not his own, hurting and bleeding and breathless, he said, Father, forgive them. He used his speech to bring glory to God and to encourage and challenge, equip those whom God has made. So don't worry that we make mistakes. Don't get stuck on those things that you've said or not said in the past. Hand them over to Jesus who has died for our sins and ask him to be at work so that from this day, this day forward, more and more, our speech would reflect who he is. And as our speech reflects it, like a rudder of a ship or the bit in the horse's mouth, we'll find that our whole life is set on that course. May we fix our words on Christ so that our heart follows Christ. Heavenly Father, we thank you today for the ascension of the risen Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you that after those 40 days, he returned to his rightful place in heaven to be at your right hand, to take his throne, the place of authority and power, so that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow. We thank you for the hope that this gives us, that one day we too will be with you in glory, that one day we will see you face to face. And we pray, please, that you would keep us faithful to this resurrection, to this ascension hope, and that you would keep us trusting in you, whatever our circumstances. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you as well that the ascended Jesus Christ still bears in his resurrection body the marks of the nails, that he understands what it is to live an ordinary human life, to know fear, to be alone, to suffer. And so we pray, Heavenly Father, for all those who are suffering as a result of the coronavirus. We pray for those who are shielding at home, for those who are lonely. We pray for those who are isolated, who haven't heard from anyone. We pray for all those who are just longing for human touch. We remember before you, Heavenly Father, those who are sick, those for whom recovery is very difficult. We pray for those in hospital and for those dying, possibly away from their families. And we pray for those families, Heavenly Father, and for everyone who is bereaved. We pray as well, Heavenly Father, for those who have lost their livelihoods because of the pandemic, for those who have been made redundant, for those working in the gig economy or just in temporary work whose jobs have disappeared, for those who have been furloughed, and for all those who find themselves tremendously insecure or in need. And we pray as well, Heavenly Father, for our schools, for the teachers and the support staff who will work during half term to ensure that schools are as safe as possible when pupils return after half term. We ask, please, Heavenly Father, that you would give 
to all of us, comfort where needed and the strength to persevere. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, finally we thank you that Jesus Christ lives in heaven to intercede for us. And so we pray, Heavenly Father, thy kingdom come. As we wait for the coming of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost, we pray please keep us alert, keep us faithful, keep us watching and keep us caring. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's pray for one another in the words of the peace. The risen Lord said to his disciples, as he says to us now, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. The peace of the Lord be always with you. We come now to the Eucharistic prayer, the prayer of thanksgiving before Holy Communion. And as I've done in past weeks, I invite you at home to make your spiritual communion. And when it comes to the point of communion, I'll read a short prayer that you can echo at home in your own hearts. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. And now, Lord, we give you thanks. Because by the glory of his resurrection, Jesus opened the way to life eternal and by his ascension has given us the sure hope that where he is, there we may be also. And the whole universe acclaims its ascended king. With choirs of angels, we sing forever to your praise. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, Heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Accept our praises, Heavenly Father, through your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. And as we follow his example and obey his command, grant that by the power of your Holy Spirit, these gifts of bread and wine, may be to us his body and his blood. Who in the night that he was betrayed took bread and gave you thanks. He broke it and gave it to his disciples saying, take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup and gave you thanks. He gave it to them, saying, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. Therefore, Heavenly Father, we remember his offering of himself made once for all upon the cross. We proclaim his mighty resurrection and his glorious ascension. We look for the coming of your kingdom and with this bread and wine we make the memorial of Christ, your Son, our Lord. And so we proclaim, dying you destroyed our death. Rising, you restored our life, Lord Jesus, come in glory. Accept through him, our great high priest, this our sacrifice of thanks and praise. And as we eat and drink these holy gifts in the presence of your divine majesty, renew us by your spirit, inspire us with your love, and unite us in the body of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, through him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, with all who stand before you in earth and heaven, we worship you, Father Almighty, in songs of everlasting praise. Blessing and honour and glory and power 
be yours for ever and ever. Amen. And as we look for the coming of God's kingdom here on earth, let us pray as Jesus himself taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Lord, we died with you on the cross. Now we are raised with you to new life. We were buried in your tomb. Now we share in your resurrection. We will live with you in heaven. Now we wait with hope. And I invite you at home to pray. My Lord Jesus Christ, I believe that you are present now by your Spirit. I love you and long to be with you. Since I cannot receive the bread and the wine, come spiritually into my heart, that I may unite myself wholly to you, now and forever. Amen. God our Father, you have raised our humanity in Christ and have fed us with the bread of heaven. Mercifully grant that nourished with such spiritual blessings, we may set our hearts in the heavenly places. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Jesus is our high priest who has passed through us, who has passed into heaven. Plead for us at the right hand of the Father. And the blessing of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit be among us and remain with us always. Amen. At the very end of our service, there will be a very um, favourite Ascension Day hymn. The head that once was crowned with thorns is crowned with glory now, but that will mark the end of our service. We'll be here at the same time next week to celebrate God's gift to us of the Holy Spirit as we remember Pentecost. And in the meantime, as we wait for the coming of God's Spirit on us, you might like to join with the rest of the diocese at 12 o'clock. The bishop is inviting us to pray with him for the coming of God's kingdom here on earth. The short service goes live at 12 o'clock on the diocesan website, but if you can't sort of join in then, you can pick it up at any other time. In the meantime, I pray that you will have a quiet, peaceful, safe and blessed week. Amen. <laughs>